So all of these things, you know, about so-called Christ is really just the story of Heru. Mm -hmm. And Heru is a, an analogy for the movements of the sun. So when they depict Heru, they depict Heru as a sun. So everybody in classical Kemet is clear this isn't a real human being walking around. It's literally giving a story form of things that you can observe every year. So for example, when they talk about the death of Christ on the cross, it's because at that point in time where you get to the winter solstice, this lowering of the sun to the lowest point in the, in the night sky uh, before it rises and then you can see it on the horizon is happening in the southeast and in the backdrop of it is the southern crux constellation the southern cross okay. constellation so all the things that you're talking about you know in terms of a Christ story yeah. is really things that if you actually know what you're what you're looking at you would be studying astronomy and if you actually know the story well if you know the story of so-called Christ well you actually know a lot about astronomy because all of those things are just metaphors for astronomical solar phenomena that's going on. No, no, real. It's not real? It's Latitude zero, longitude zero. Speaking from the center of the world, Ghana. This is where we are. This is the center of Pan-Africanism. Moving black people forward, uniting us on the same platform, Telling the stories that concerns us. Boom! Zo TV talking points. Do not change the dial. Stay tuned. So all of these things, you know, about so-called Christ is really just the story of Heru. Mm -hmm. And Heru is a, an analogy for the movements of the sun. So when they depict Heru, they depict Heru as a sun. So everybody in classical Kemet is clear this isn't a real human being walking around. It's literally giving a story form of things that you can observe every year. So for example, when they talk about the death of Christ on the cross, it's because at that point in time where you get to the winter solstice, this lowering of the sun to the lowest point in the, in the night sky uh, before it rises and then you can see it on the horizon is happening in the southeast and in the backdrop of it is the southern crux constellation the southern cross okay. constellation so all the things that you're talking about you know in terms of a Christ story yeah. is really things that if you actually know what you're what you're looking at you would be studying astronomy and if you actually know the story well, if you know the story of so-called Christ well, you actually know a lot about astronomy because all of those things are just metaphors for astronomical solar phenomena that's going on. No, no, real. It's not real? So it's not even the coming of Christ? Yeah. But this ties into what it actually is, this 2024, is referring to what's uh, known as the great month and then the great year. Yeah. So this is that you have the precession of the equinoxes, and there is a noted scholar... <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing there. Eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I was just going to go and ask you about the Noah's Ark, whether it's in the, you know... Um, you know so before we go to the, before know, we go to the jokes, go there. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> Before we go to jokes, we'll go to real things that actually exist. So, um, so this is actually quite interesting. So you can look up um, no, no, Charles Finch, Dr. Charles Finch. Uh, and he goes into this cosmological wheel of time, and it deals with the precession of equinoxes. And the idea is every about 2,000 uh, years plus, uh, you have the equinoxes are happening where the sun rises with a particular constellation in the background at the time of the equinox. So for a good 2,100 years there about, you have this thing happening in this particular constellation where we are right now is in the constellation was now known as Pisces, mm -hmm. which would be referred to as NTU, the fish yeah. in the classical Kemet. Uh, prior to that, you had it happening in the constellation of uh, the ram, which in classical times would refer to Amen who was represented as a ram. So you'll see this so-called sphinx that has a ram's head. That's what uh, in contemporary times the Greeks would refer to as Aries, right? So it's okay. like what you know in terms of uh, the astrological signs that people have, it happens in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So as in the course of a year, you would have Pisces, you would have Aries mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here it, we're at Pisces now, but before that you had Aries. And then before that you had Taurus, which okay. is representing the bull. Okay. So what you're actually marking is not the birth of so-called Christ. You're marking the end of one age, which is the age of the ram, 
and then the age of the fish, which okay. is what we're in right now. And we're about to go into the age of the water bringer, which would be known in classical chemistry as Hapi or Minat, the nurse, okay. right? So these are actual, again, if you actually understand anything about the Bible, if you've read the Bible, you actually know about a lot about astronomy. But the thing is, uh, you mentioned Constantine. In these councils of Nicaea, that's when they decided on these things that now people take to be real. But literally, it was just a conversation, the outcome of a conversation among non-black people. Of, are we going to say yeah. that the father is different from the son, or that they're all one, or that there's a father and a son and the Holy Ghost and they're all equal? Like, literally, they're sitting down, just like me and you are sitting down, yeah. and having a conversation. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, things yeah. that people believe now are just because randomly it would be like they toss a coin yeah. or roll some dice and say, this is what we're yeah, going to yeah, do. having the one and having some talk. Right, so you have you know those who uh, lost those debates, and they ended up you know getting expelled. They have to go. Uh, you have areas, for example. Yeah, they have to go and do something else, or they'll be killed because they said this is what we're going. We're going with this story. Yeah. Even the idea that this is a real man who lived—that's something that they're deciding upon. Yeah. As opposed to prior to that, everybody knew that this story is a story of Heru. That's why I mentioned in the so-called pyramid text. All these other stories that you find of a death and resurrection of a savior, yeah. they're all there because everyone can see what happens with the sun. Yeah. And nowadays we're looking at phones and laptops. And yeah. But this understanding is what everybody knew. So you can go to India and they have this exact same story of death and resurrection of a uh, savior. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah. go to what's now, you know, or what was Persia, you can find the same story. You can go to, you know, Kemet, you can find the story. You can go to Greece, you can find the story. So all of these saviors existed before Christ because that whole Christ story is really talking about solar phenomena that everybody knew. Yeah. Yeah. Among all the pharaohs, who is the most, how do you call it now? When I say edified, or the pharaoh that has been well known, and why is the pharaoh known? For? What, what is he known for? Right. Um, it depends on who you're talking about is going to know it. But um, if we're talking about generally, mm -hmm. I would say the one who may be most well known would be, um, well, I, I, actually, I, I can pause. So I would probably say Tutankhamen, Tutankhamen. Sarah Tutankhamen. Okay. And that's because his tomb was uh, robbed by white people intact. It was intact. Because I had mentioned before in the Valley of the Kings yeah. that. Um, a lot of these were, you know, the tomb was robbed. A lot of tombs were robbed in classical times mm -hmm. or in the times of the Greeks and Romans, which is a classical, that's very recent times. Yeah. Um, so they would go in, they would find stuff, they would steal gold, they would, you know, destroy the sarcophagus, they would do all types of, you know, things. They would take the body of the ruler, break it up into pieces, and they would sell it as medicine where they would eat it in Western Europe. This is what white people, quote unquote, white people were doing. Um, but this was one that was found in intact where everything it hadn't been opened in classical times oh. nobody had robbed it that, that come exactly exactly okay. and he wasn't like let's say the most glorious you know ruler he wasn't you know the most well known at the time what's significant about him i would say for black people is at the time that uh his father who was akhenaten um at during his time that's where he banned uh, amen Right, which was one of the natural. He banned all of the natural except for those we said were basically manifestation of Aten, which is you know basically what in contemporary times people say this is the origin of monotheism. He said you can't talk about under, any other under, under Akhenaten. Under Akhenaten, yeah. he said you can't talk about any other nature except for Aten. Okay, and the, anything that you talk about, you have to say that this is uh, basically a manifestation of Aten in another way, okay. right? Um, and you find like the name of Amin being chiseled out. Mm -hmm. Those rulers who have Amin in their name, that Amin part is chiseled out. Okay. So that's part of his quote unquote religious reform. Okay. Was significant at least in classical times for so, but, Sarah Tutankhamen. But, but, why, why did he do that? Why why was he trying to? So he's what father of what monotheism or something like that. That's what that's what in contemporary times people refer to him as. Yeah. Um, so why did he do that? What was his concept of creating that monotheism? So let me let me just land on why uh, people know Sarah Tutankhamen. That again, what was significant about him is he decided that he's going to reverse what his father did. Even his name Tutankhamen. Mm. Tutankhamen. So Tut translates to image. Ankh translates to living mm -hmm. in this case, and then Amen. So he's like the living image of Amen. Mm -hmm. That means if you want to know what Amen looks like, just look at me, and now you know That's exactly it. what Amen looks like. Okay. His name. So again, the reason why a lot of people know of him 
And you know, the significance of him in classical times was that a lot of the, what they refer to as reforms that his father did. And then you, you're asking like why he did that? Yeah. Now, there are different ideas why. One is that the uh, so-called priesthood of Amen had gotten more powerful. The than priesthood even, of Amen. Amen. So you had all these different hoots, what are referred to as enclosures in classical Kemet. Let's pause there. The Amen we're talking about is A-M-U-N or A-M-E-N. So you'll find people who are writing either way because, again, the vowels aren't represented. Okay. So you have the reed leaf, mm. you have the men, which refers to that which is stable, which is enduring, and then the in, which you'll see as, um, you know, ripples on water, and then you'll see the image of the netcher himself with okay. the beard. So that's how it would be written. Or you'll see the falcon on the standard, like standing on the standard. So that's how it's written. So it's, it's based on how people would see it in contemporary times. You could look at Coptic, or you can just do the Egyptological convention of inserting an E. Okay. So the reason why a lot of the non-black uh, Egyptologists prefer to do A-M-U-N is because they see Amen as, okay, after you say your prayers and you say Amen, yes. it's a different thing. But you'll find that, you know, in various languages that are very much related to Meta Nature, you'll find it still, you know, said or spoken as Amen or some type of version of that. So, for example, even in the Akan language, if someone who's born on Saturday, you greet them, Majo, you know, that you know that, that person is uh, born on a Saturday, you can say, yeah, Amen. If you look at the name of the uh, supreme being in Dogon, mm -hmm. the name is Ama. And again, a female who's born on Onyami's day is also called Ama. If you go to Kenya Rwanda, they have Imana as the name for the supreme being. So you have different variations in these various daughter languages of how it's pronounced. Yeah. So based on those, and then also looking at Coptic, which is the most direct, that's how you will come to, all right, so let's use this vowel and not use that vowel. Yeah. I hear there are more pyramids in Sudan than today's Egypt. Yeah, that's correct. Is it, is it true? Yeah, that's correct. And how come that we don't know much about this day, the pyramids in, in, in Sudan, but we know a lot about the pyramids in Egypt? Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of that has to do with, one, for these non-black people, what they would like to say is that, quote-unquote, Kemet is not black, which doesn't make any sense, which is why they say Egypt. Because you say ancient Egypt, it doesn't tell you anything. As soon as you say Kemet, now they have to start coming up with stories. Mm. Oh, the soil is black. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. They have yeah. to start coming. But if you start talking very much about Sudan, there's no dispute about Sudan. Okay. There really isn't a dispute about what's now contemporary Egypt either. Yeah. Because literally, and you know, even more so because you have all of these southern uh, territories that were calling themselves various names that didn't necessarily have to do with their blackness. Yeah. So you have Kush, for example. You have Wawat, for example. You have Irjet, for example. You have all of these different communities, and they're naming themselves different things based on you know whatever, either the topology or whatever. But the only one that I know of, that I should say, because some of them, their languages aren't translated, so it's possible that it could be something else. Um, but the only one in classical times that we know of for certain that refer to themselves as black people is the one called Kemet. Now, why would they call themselves black people? For the same reason that we still do it to this day, yeah. is that once you know that you have non-black enemies, then you know that you should come together on the basis of what you have in common, which is your blackness. So, for example, you know, the people in Jamaica uh, at the time of Nana Paul Bogo, they didn't read Menu Yeah. but they started saying cleave to the black. Now, the people who are in Jamaica were coming from all kind of places. Yeah. You have people who were Akan, you have people who were Emory, you have people who were Ghana, yeah. you have people who were Yoruba. Yeah. You had everybody there, but at a certain point in time they realized I'm not getting raped because I'm Akan and you're not getting, you know, lynched because you're Edwin. We're all black, let's cleave to the black. So it's like a natural thing that happens. You know, the people in the so-called black power movement in the United States, they weren't necessarily reading Middle Nature text to realize black power, we need to come together on the basis of what we have in common. That you know, that's based on genotype and phenotype, and really, that's the only thing that's ever existed in terms of a survival thrust. And it's not just limited to people that you can see zebras come together in herds. What do they have in common? They have common genes. <laughs> that's their ancestry. They have common phenotype. They look alike, and therefore, they have common descent. And that's what their shared interests are based on. If you look at orcas, right? They come together in pods. That's what they call killer whales. Like, no, they don't have to read texts in Medu Nature and know let's come together what we have in common. Yeah. That's shared genotype and phenotype. Yeah. If you go to 
are Harris hawks. This is a type of hawk that hunts in packs. If you go to wolves, if you go to buffalo, if you go to wildebeest, every single intelligent creature on the entire planet Earth knows, let's come together on the basis of what we have in common because we have shared interests. As soon as we have shared genes, then we know that to preserve our, our lineage, that means that we have to come together. Now, there, are, there can be internal flight, fighting. You can see zebras fighting against each other over who's going to be able to mate and whatever. But when the lion comes up, when the cheetah comes up, they put all that to the side, and then they move off as a, as a herd. And what I'm uh, asserting, and this is also the theoretical framework I'm using for the book, The Construction of Black Civilization, is that you found that exact same thing happening in classical Kemet. You found the same thing in IT, what they call Haiti, mm -hmm. that all those people who are coming, some were coming from Dahomey, some were coming from or y'all, mm -hmm. people were coming from everywhere. everywhere. But then in the constitution by Destiny, he says we're all Les Noirs, we're all the blacks, the yeah. necks, right? Yeah. So again, time and time again, so it's not just one time that it happened, yeah. but time and time again, even independently, we don't even know about what was going on in Kemet. And even to this point, even as I'm saying it, this will be like a revelation to some people. Like right now, they don't know it. But again, if you actually understand how living beings, all intelligent living beings work, this is how we operate. We come together on the basis of what we have in common for right. shared interests, for our shared survival. Boom! So who is this Pharaoh that the Bible talks about? So that's an imaginary <laughs> one. <laughs> so even, and, and let, what lets you know it's an imaginary is that they don't have a name for this imaginary one. There are no Israelites who are enslaved. Those were the Hyksos who came as invaders and enslavers, and they were driven out with their tails between their legs, so they came up with a story in order Boom. to justify Boom. why they ended up in Jerusalem. Boom! I think we'll be talking about Hyksos too, you know, because we need to take it uh, one dosage at a time. Otherwise, people are taking too much in. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yes. Zo TV is a talking point. Zo TV is a talking point. You seek knowledge. This is where you need to be. I think we've, we, you know, we, 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 um, we, we bring our session down, and um, we'll come back again next week with a different punch. But before we leave, I let my man give you his last words because you guys need to be connected to the family on a different level. So, I'm being full, come on, please. Give them your last words. Yeah, so anytime I come on, you know, YouTube or any place like this, I always like to do my non a Harriet Tubman routine, which is to help people get free and off of the digital plantation. So I'd like to invite all of you to uh, download Abibi to me as an app. Uh, you can get it on App Store, Play Store, whatever. Um, and it's a black space, very much like in classical Kemet, we made that land, the land of black people. We're working on doing that again, both on the digital front and then also on the physical front. So you can download a BB to me. Uh, also, I'd like to invite all of your viewers to the Sankofa journey. And with that, you will travel all around Ghana. You'll be learning the language. You'll be eating the foods and tasting those you know, amazing tastes that we have here. You'll be seeing the ladies, the young men who are here. You can enjoy yourself. You can enjoy the breeze. You can enjoy some pito. Yeah. And so that's the Sankofa journey. At the Pala Kitchen. <laughs> that's Sankofa journey.com. S-A-N-K-O-F-A. J-O-U-R-N-E-Y.com. With that, we have the abibi to me conference. You can either do the conference separately or as part of the Sankofa journey. If you're on the journey, you get the conference as part of it. But for those who are interested, go to conference.abibitumi, A-B-I-B-I-T-U-M-I.com. We also have a documentary honoring my father, Nana Kamal Kambon. You can find that on abibitumi.com slash quiet warrior. So there's a lot of black powerful things going on. And for those who are interested in repatriating, as you may know, uh, Baba Aminyo and yeah. Mausi, they are repatriating. So you can check out repatriatetogana.com and we assist people in citizenship, land acquisition, uh, purchasing a vehicle. We just assisted uh, a future repatriate and purchasing a vehicle here in Ghana. You know, getting married, having children, we get you midwives, doulas, uh, if you don't want to do the vaccines and shots, so all of that repatriate to Ghana. That's R E P A T R I A T E T O G H A N A, repatriate to Ghana.com, or the short URL is R number 2 G H, R 2 G H.com. That will take you to the exact same uh, spot. So again, check us out at BB to me. I'll never be commenting on this YouTube video. So if you want to comment, comment on abibitumitv.com and hit me up on Cash App. That's Obinfo Abadele, O-B-E-N-F-O, O-B-A-D-E-L-E, Obinfo Abadele. Hit me up, Abibitumi, Abibifahodie.
Boom, boom. Zo TV talking points. Do not change the dial. Stay tuned.